the director of an engineering company is interviewing an applicant for a job. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Ah, good morning. It's Mr. Robinson, isn't it? Have a seat. Stephen Robinson. Yes. Is that S T E V E N or P H? It's V. Okay, I've got your letter of application, but I need a few more details for the file. Now you're from Manchester. What exactly is the address?、Uh, yes, it's Dynevor Gardens. That's D Y N E V O R, Presswich. Thanks. And telephone?、Oh, well, it isn't mine. It's the landlord's, but I can be contacted. It's four eight three two five zero. Ah ha. The landlord lives in, does he? Well, he has the flat downstairs, and he's a friend of the family, anyway. I see. Okay. According to your letter, I imagine you were born in.、Uh, let me see. Nineteen sixty. Sixty-one. Right. And the date? Twelfth of July. Thank you. And I believe you're married.、Oh, no, no, I'm getting married, but not for a few months. Oh, sorry. Well, I mean, congratulations. Is it going to be in Manchester?、Uh, well, no, actually, my fiance is from Wales, so we're getting married in her home village near Bangor. Oh, how nice! Now, as you know, when you apply for a post with Williams Engineering, we need to find out a few things about both your academic background and more recent work experience. The latter being especially important in respect of this rather specialised position in the area of water management. First of all, A levels. Yes, I've got three: geography, maths, and physics. Geography, maths, and physics. Okay. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Now listen and answer questions seven to ten. And what about your degree? I went to Sheffield University and got an engineering degree with water management as my specialisation. Ah.、Uh -huh. And as for work experience, I started out after graduating in 1986 in China, working for the Chinese government. Did you work as a volunteer? No, I, I did get a nominal salary. It was a two-year irrigation project. That sounds fascinating. How did you organise that? You say it wasn't a British company then? No, no. My university had links with a Chinese engineering university, so it was organised at that level. And after that? Then I came back, moved to Manchester, and have been working with Latimer Engineering since then. And what exactly are you doing for Latimer? Oh, I'm working in irrigation again. This time as a project research assistant. Great. I've got your details. Now let's move on to a more general discussion about what we're looking. For. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an introductory speech to students at a summer school. You have thirty seconds to look at questions eleven to fourteen.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Climb Summer School. Now, I know most of you have travelled a long way to get here, and you're probably looking forward to settling into your rooms. So I promise I won't keep you long. But we've got to get through this very brief induction just to make your stay here as pleasurable as possible. Now, as you can see, while we're located very close to the centre of London, we're actually quite cut off from the main road, and we've got plenty of space for our facilities and students. This was part of our founder's vision, Jasmine Klein, who thought that the best environment for teenage students would be a place that combines the comforts of a big cosmopolitan city. With the beauty and serenity of a quiet, remote site. Now, back in 1983, when our school was founded, this all here was an abandoned warehouse, and the classes were held in the main building that you can see over there. There were no trees, no conifers surrounding the property. There wasn't even a main gate. It took years and a great deal of effort to get our school to where it is today. And I'm sure that if you take a look at page thirty-four in your brochures, where you can find a picture of what the school used to look like back then, you'll agree that the changes we've made are more than impressive. But it's not just the facilities that make Climb Summer School special, obviously, and I'm certain you already know this. Over the following ten weeks, you'll receive an assortment of classes on a variety of topics, ranging from language, literature, and poetry to creative writing, communication, and project management. All of these modules have been designed to improve your chances of getting a place in the universities of your choice, while also giving you the opportunity to learn, excel, and of course, also socialize with people from all over the world. I can tell you, just among the thirty of you. We've got about twenty-one different nationalities. So what happens now? First of all, I'll be handing out a map of the premises for you to have a look at and explaining where everything is. Once we're done here, you'll all be taken to your rooms where you can unpack and relax for a couple of hours. And later on, we'll be having our first activity of the day—a mix and match lunch in the main hall, where you'll have the chance to meet your new classmates. Later on in the afternoon, we'll be handing out your first project assignments and splitting you into teams. And tonight we'll be having our very first film night, starting with an early twentieth-century special. You now have thirty seconds to look at questions fifteen to twenty. So, let's get on with the map. You've already got a version of it in your brochures, so if you can open them to the last page, so we can have a look. Very well. As I showed you before, the actual school is right over there in the middle. That's where you'll be having most of your classes. Adjacent to it, you'll find the main hall, which is where we'll be hosting most events, such as today's lunch. On the left from the main building, you'll find a smaller building. Which is where the accommodation and welfare offices are located. This is labelled as the garden office at the front, and it's easy to spot because it has a green door. Each of you is assigned to a different residence hall. We've got three residence halls in total: one on the left and two on the right. The one right next to the garden office is Ursula Hall, named after our founder's sister, while the other two are Peter Hall and William Hall. Now. As you can see, there are three more buildings to the left of the semicircle here, and one more building on the right-hand side next to William Hall. So that one, which is shaped a bit like a dome, is the pavilion. This is where all your letters will be delivered, and in the basement floor, you'll also find a laundrette. Please make sure you've got plenty of one-pound coins, as you'll need one for the washing machine and another for the dryer. And that row of buildings on the left. The one closest to us here at the gate is the canteen, where you'll be able to buy snacks as well as breakfast, lunch, and dinner, 
on days when we don't have an event with food provided. The next one is the gym, which is open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. from Monday to Friday, and until 10 p.m. at the weekend. And the last building, right over there, is the study centre, where you'll find plenty of computers and books, as well as a great selection of DVDs and magazines that you can borrow with only a small refundable deposit of five pounds. Now, please remember to keep your student card with you at all times, as you'll need it to access most of these facilities. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students discussing a project they have to do as part of a literature course on great books. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Joey. How are you doing? I heard you were sick. Oh, hi, Olivia. Yeah, I had a virus last week, and I missed a whole pile of lectures, like the first one on the great books in literature, where Dr. Castle gave us all the information about the semester project. I can give you copies of the handouts. I've got them right here. But that's okay. I already collected the handouts, but I'm not very clear about all the details. I know we each have to choose an individual author. I think I'm going to do Carlos Castaneda. I'm really interested in South American literature. Have you checked he's on the list that Dr. Castle gave us? We can't just choose anyone. Yeah, I checked. It's okay. Who did you choose? Well, I was thinking of choosing Ernest Hemingway, but then I thought, no, I'll do a British author, not an American one. So I chose Emily Bronte. Okay. And first of all, it says we have to read a biography of our author. I guess it's okay if we just look up information about him on the Internet? No, it's got to be a full-length book. I think the minimum length's 250 pages. There's a list of biographies. Didn't you get that? Oh, right. I didn't realize we had to stick with that. So what do we have to do when we've read the biography? Well, then we have to choose one work by the writer. Again, it's got to be something quite long. We can't just read a short story. But I guess a collection of short stories would be okay? Yes, or even a collection of poems, they said. But I think most people are doing novels. I'm going to do Wuthering Heights. I've read it before, but I really want to read it again now I've found out more about the writer. And then the video. We have to make a short video about our author and about the book. How long has it got to be? A minute. What? Like 60 seconds? And we got to give all the important information about their life and the book we choose? <laughs> well, you can't do everything. I wrote it down somewhere. Yes, Dr. Castle said we had to find or write a short passage that helps to explain the author's passion for writing, why they're a writer. So we can back this up with reference to important events in the writer's life, if they're relevant. But it's up to us, really. The video's meant to portray the essence of the writer's life and the piece of writing we choose. So when we read the biography, we have to think about what kind of person our writer is. Yes, and the historical context and so on. So for my writer, Emily Bronte, the biography gave a really strong impression of the place where she lived and the countryside around. Right. I'm beginning to get the idea. Before you hear the rest of the talk,
You have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Uh, can I check the other requirements with you? Sure. The handout said after we'd read the biography, we had to read the work we'd chosen by our author and choose a passage that's typical in some way, that typifies the author's interests and style. Yes, but at the same time, it has to relate to the biographical extract you choose, there's got to be some sort of theme linking them. Okay, I'm with you. And then you have to think about the video. So are we meant to dramatize the scene we choose? I guess we could, but there's not a lot of time for that. I think it's more how we can use things like sound effects to create the atmosphere, the feeling we want. And presumably visuals as well? Yeah, of course. I mean, I suppose that's the whole point of making a video. But whatever we use has to be historically in keeping with the author. We can use things like digital image processing to do it all. So we can use any computer software we want? Sure. And it's important that we use a range, not just one software program. That's actually one of the things we're assessed on. Okay. Oh, and something else that's apparently really important is to keep track of the materials we use and to acknowledge them. Including stuff we download off the internet, presumably? Yeah, so our video has to list all the material used with details of the source in a bibliography at the end. Okay, and you were talking about assessment of the project. Did they give us the criteria? I couldn't find anything on the handout. Sure, he gave us them in the lecture. Let's see, you get 25% just for getting all the components done. That's both sets of reading and the video. Then the second part is actually how successful we are at getting the essence of the work. They call that content, and that counts for 50%. Then the last 25% is on the video itself, the artistic and technical side. Great. Well, that sounds a lot of work, but a whole lot better than just handing in a paper. But thanks a lot, Olivia. You're welcome. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about English language. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 31 to 37. Those of you who were here last week will remember that we talked about the journey of the English language from its early Indo-European origins through to Old English, Middle English, and then to Early and Late Modern English before it reached the form that it has today. Today, we will be continuing that theme by focusing on the future of the English language and all the places it might go from here. There are about 2.1 billion people around the world who can speak English. Out of these, only 400 million are native speakers, which means that four in five English speakers are non-natives. 
This is obviously quite an impressive number, considering that just two centuries ago, in 1801, there were only about 20 million speakers of English around the world, and languages like French and German were ahead of English in terms of how many people were using them. But what does it mean? What it means is that the future of the English language doesn't really depend on its native speakers, but on that massive number of non-native speakers learning it around the world. Has everyone... Has anyone heard the term pidgin before, or creole? A pidgin is a simplified version of a language which acts as a bridge between two people who don't have a common language, allowing them to communicate with each other. While a creole is a language that evolves from a pidgin, with the difference that it is fully formed with clear grammatical rules and vocabulary. There are currently dozens of pidgin and creole languages based on English around the world. For example, Nigerian pidgin or Jamaican patois. These languages are also known as Englishes. What's interesting about these Englishes is how different they sound to, for lack of a better term, proper English. Take the word trousers, for instance. In Sheng, which is a Kenyan Creole language, they're called longi because they're long. But even versions of English that are recognized as official variations or dialects still differ greatly from each other. Americans and Jamaicans would call the back of a car where you store your luggage the trunk. Britons, Australians, Canadians, and other Commonwealth countries would call it the boot. A subway in the UK is a tunnel under a road that allows pedestrians to cross safely. In the US, it's an underground train. You might think of these differences as minute, but when you take into account the dozens of different versions of English out there, a very intriguing parallel arises with another language from the past. Latin. Latin, too, used to be a lingua franca. Nowadays, it's all but dead, spoken only by a few clerics and scholars. At some point in history, it splintered into various different languages which became known as Romance languages. For example, Spanish, Italian, or French. There are some that theorize that the same thing might happen to English in the near or distant future, that all these Englishes we have today in different countries will continue to develop, so pigeons will turn into Creole languages, and Creole languages will turn into just languages, and English itself, as we know it today, will disappear, or become less and less important. It's an interesting theory, if nothing else. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 38 to 40. It makes sense that, as English grows in popularity, countries, especially those with a strong sense of identity and tradition, will develop their own versions of the language, marked by the idiosyncrasies of their culture. Just think of the contribution of dialects such as Jamaican or South African English. In the past 50 years alone, they've added about 25,000 words to the English language. Most of these related to a local context, that wouldn't have existed in English before the spread of colonialism. In terms of numbers, just those are enough for a brand new language. There are some flaws to this theory too, however. While it's true that Latin and English have a lot of similarities in terms of how they developed or have developed throughout history, there is one big difference. We currently live in an era of globalization. Today, you can be in India and stream an American film or TV series in seconds. You can be in Nigeria and listen to British music. You can be in Brazil and read a novel from an Australian author. Just a few centuries ago, this was unthinkable. So what's the other way that English could go? According to some experts, there's the possibility that it could maintain its status as the world's global language, but with a few differences. Already today, most conversations in English occur between non-native speakers. While many of these might be fluent, 
the majority probably only have an intermediate understanding of the language, devoid of the nuances, colloquialisms, and complex collocations that native speakers employ in their interactions. This means that over time, English could turn into some sort of world speak, the official lingua franca for the entire world, but in a simplified form. Some scholars have even started trying to develop that version of English by selecting the most useful words in the English vocabulary for non-native speakers to learn. Robert McCrum has compiled a comprehensive list of 1,500 words, for example, a version of English that he calls globish. And what about traditional native speaker English? It might continue to exist, but lose its popularity, as the previous theory suggests. There are many more theories about the future of the English language, of course. I've only focused on the two main ones, because they clearly demonstrate our uncertainty when it comes to how this beautiful language will develop. English is in a unique, unprecedented position. No other language has achieved the same levels of popularity in human history, especially in terms of non-native speakers. So, as this is clearly uncharted territory, only time will be able to tell us what will happen. That is the end of part four. Welcome to our channel. Today in this video, I will be discussing with you writing task 1 and the question for today is the graph above, these are two graphs, so the graphs above represent the population using internet and the average spending on shopping on the internet per person. So the graph is representing the population using the internet of five different countries, Spain, France, Sweden, Germany and UK and the average spending on shopping on the internet per person in euros so this blue one is representing germany like 46 euros per person sweden 76 euros france 57 spain 10 and uk 87 euros per person and uh, let's see how we can write this now so starting with the introduction, the rendered bar and pie charts depict the population of six different countries assessing the internet and making online purchases in 2003. So uh, in the question, it has to be in 2003 or whatever the year would be. Okay, so that doesn't matter. We just have to write that year. So this is the rephrasing of the given question like the rendered graph what the graph is representing it is representing the population using the internet of six different one two three four five it's five not six five sorry for this five different countries those are using internet right and the average spending and making online purchases in 2003 Overall, it is discernible from the graph that Swedish people extensively use the internet. So we can see here the most number of people in Sweden use the uh, internet. Like if we compare with the other four countries, 35% of the Swedish people use the internet. But UK residents spend the most money on online purchasing. But the spending on online purchasing was higher by the UK, uh, by the people of UK. As we can see, 87 euros per person, the spending was on online shopping. Okay. Now, explicitly, 35% of people in Sweden use the internet. UK's one-fifth populace operated the internet. And if we talk about UK, so one-fifth means 20% of the population used the or assessed the internet operated internet and the ratio for france people was half of the uk and the ratio between the we can see the difference was of 10 percent so 
the population of uh, france was half of the population of the uk those assessed the or those used the internet on the other hand spain had the smallest population accounting for only 5% of the total so only 5% of the spanish people used the internet so now we have discussed this table graph we will be moving to the pie chart in terms of average spending on online shopping each person in the united kingdom spent over 87 euros so if we talk about uk so in united kingdom each person so because it is of per person 87 euros was spent by each person on online shopping however swedish citizens spent euros 76 per person In comparison, there was a significant drop in the online expenditure in France with fifty-seven euros and Germany with forty-six euros per person. So, if we talk about Swedish citizens, seventy-six euros per person was spent, and if we talk about uh, France and sorry, yeah, France and Germany, fifty-seven and forty-six euros. France with fifty-seven euros and Germany with forty-seven, forty-six euros per person. Spain trailed the other nation regarding online purchasing with residents spending only ten euros per person. So the because the already see the ratio only five percent of the people are using the internet. That's why the spending was also very low, only ten euros per person. So this was for today. If you like the video, do hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. I'll meet you in the next video. Till then, bye bye and take care.